Sometimes when you're trying to synthesize a molecule, you have to use a protecting group. And in this video, we're going to talk about how to protect alcohols using a trialkyl silyl group. And so let's say our goal is to make this target compound over here on the right. And uh, we need to start with this compound over here on the left. And so you might think that this organolithium compound right here would function as a nucleophile, right? So we have a negative one formal charge in this carbon. So this lone pair of electrons, right, is going to be our nucleophile and attack this carbon, which is a little bit partially positive right here. And so these electrons will kick off onto your bromine and you would end up adding this carbon and this carbon onto to form your target molecule, so like that. Unfortunately, this is not the reaction that occurs because not only can or organolithium compounds be strong nucleophiles, right? They can also be strong bases. And so what would actually happen is this lone pair of electrons here would function as a base, right? Take this proton, leaving these electrons behind in the oxygen to form an alk oxide. So really you would form uh, you would form this product over here. So we would have an oxygen. The oxygen would have now three lone pairs of electrons around it. All right, giving it a negative one formal charge, and we would have lithium plus. So we would form an alk oxide product instead. And so the point of a protecting group is we need to protect this hydroxyl group to prevent it from reacting, right? So if we can somehow protect this group, we can allow our reaction to, to occur at this portion of the molecule, and then we could remove our protecting group to form our target compound. And so that's the idea behind it. So let's go ahead and, and show how we can use a, a, a protecting group. So over here on the right, we have, uh, this would be T-butyl dimethyl silyl chloride, right? So there's a tert butyl group attached to a silicon, and then there's two methyl groups attached to the silicon and also a chlorine. So this would be T-butyl or tert butyl dimethyl silyl chloride. So T-B-D-M-S-C-L. And if you think about this silicon, right? The silicon is bonded to a carbon here, a carbon here, a carbon here, and a chlorine. And all of those, uh, the carbon and the chlorine, are more electronegative than the silicon. So they're going to withdraw some electron density from the silicon, making the silicon partially positive. And so the silicon can function as an electrophile, right? It's electrophilic. And we can get some electrons from the oxygen. So uh, the alcohol over here is going to function as a nucleophile, and the lone pair of electrons is going to attack the silicon. And then these electrons will kick off onto your chlorine. And so we would lose HCl in the product in, in the process. And the imidazole, one of the things the, the imidazole does is help to remove the HCl. And the mechanism is a little more complicated than what I've shown. Um, but this is just a simple way of thinking about it, right? So you have a nucleophile, electrophile, and you're going to put your protecting group onto your alcohol. So let's go ahead and draw uh, the product of this reaction, right? We would ha now have our oxygen bonded to the silicon and our oxygen would have two lone pairs of electrons around it and the silicon is bonded to two methyl groups and also a tert butyl group like that so we have put on our protecting group and uh, sometimes you might see instead of drawing out all of that stuff around the silicon you might just see an oxygen right and then you might see t b d m s for our protecting group which is our t butyl dimethyl silo protecting group like that so this would be another way of representing uh, that portion of the molecule and so now that we've added uh, now that we've added our protecting group we can go ahead and react with our organolithium compounds let me go ahead and draw in our organolithium compound again right so we had a carb anion here Right, which now can function as a nucleophile. So this lone pair of electrons right, could attack this carbon right here, and these electrons would kick off onto the bromine. And so we can go ahead and, uh, and draw what we would get from that. So now we would have, right, we would add on our triple bond right here. So once again, let's highlight some carbons. Right, this carbon would have added onto here. This carbon is right here. And then we have the, these electrons, right, formed this bond right here like that. And so we still have our protecting groups. Let's go ahead and draw that too, right? We have our oxygen, 
and bonded to our oxygen we have our silicon with our methyl groups and also our tert butyl group like that and so now that we've done the the desired reaction uh, now we can take off our protecting group right so we can remove it uh, to form our target compound and so we need to have uh, something that reacts selectively with the silicon here and so we're going to use tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride so tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride which is really just a good source of fluoride anion so I'm going to go ahead and draw in a fluoride anion here which is normally a extremely poor nucleophile so um, but it's actually selective for for silicon so if, if the fluoride functions as a nucleophile right it's going to attack the silicon here and it can do this for for a couple of reasons so uh, let's let's talk about let's talk about those reasons here so first of all the silicon is bonded to some carbons, right? And uh, silicon is bigger than carbon, right? If you look at where it is in the periodic table. And so the silicon carbon bonds are longer than we're used to seeing. And that means that there's decreased steric hindrance, right? So the silicon is, is a little bit more exposed and that allows the fluoride anion to attack it a little more. So another factor that allows this is, is uh, silicon is in the third period on the periodic table. So it has vacant d orbitals. And so we can go ahead and show the bond forming right, between the fluorine and the silicon. So let me go ahead and draw what we would get after the fluoride attacks the silicon. So we would have this portion of the molecule. Right, and we would have our oxygen. Our oxygen bonded to our silicon in this, in this intermediate. And now we could show the fluorine bonded to the silicon like that. And the silicon is still bonded to two methyl groups and also a tert butyl group like that. This would give the silicon a negative one formal charge. And uh, it looks a little bit weird because we see silicon have, has five bonds to it. But uh, that's again, once it's okay because of where silicon is on the PRI table, right? It has those, has those d orbitals. And so forming, forming five bonds for an intermediate is okay. It's okay for it to have an expanded octet. Another reason why fluoride um, can attack the silicon very well is because the bond that forms between fluorine and silicon ha happens to be very strong, right? So it's a very strong single bond here. And we can, uh, we can finish up uh, by, by kicking these electrons back onto the oxygen and uh, protonating and forming our target compound. So we would go ahead and form our target compound here. So we would get back our alcohol like that and we also successfully added on this portion of the molecule on the right and then we would also form right we now have the flor the fluorine bonded to the silicon like that so we selectively removed our protecting group and we formed our target compound and so that's the idea of of a protecting group it allows you to, uh, to protect one area of the molecule and react with another area of the molecule. And it's also nice to have it easily removed to get back um, your target molecule.